All right, so we're looking at uh, chapter four of the of the youth manual. So, um, you know, uh, as we're kind of working our way through that youth fitness manual, um, it's going to pivot. You know, we we started off by like the foundational stuff, right? Like like start to develop some rapport. You know. Um, help them set goals, you know, that are, that are in the short term, understand like the anatomic and physiologic differences. But now we're really pivoting into, uh, we want to understand fitness assessments because obviously that's going to determine, you know, a little bit about our client's posture. Uh, once we know about our client's posture, then we can um, uh, pivot that into to writing programs, right? So I always like to kind of put this at the top here. Uh, when I'm talking about like fitness assessments, which this is not in the notes or this isn't in the in the reading or anything like that. But if you look at like what our industry is, right, like as personal trainers, like what our jobs are in three steps, right, we first identify problems, um, solve that problem, and then we implement the solution, right? That's the one, two, three, get a new client, figure out what's going on with them, address it, you know, and then start training them, right? So like identifying the problem, we do that through integrated fitness assessments, right? If someone tells us they have like, you know, shoulder instability, or if their problem is like, hey, I'm you know, trying to fit into this wedding dress at a specific date, right? Like we have like specific identity, like we, we're going to clearly define like what it is we're working on. And if you have a client who's like, you know, like I said, they have shoulder instability and you do a posture analysis and you notice that they have really bad rounded shoulders and arms falling forward, well, then you need to write a program to address that, right? If they have like shoulder rounding, they need to do external rotation exercises where they're opening up this way, right? Uh, and you need to do like, if they have like, um, uh, uh, you know, arms falling forward, we need to strengthen the low trap so they get better at raising their arms up overhead like this, right? So that's how we're going to write a program. We're going to we're going to put exercises to a routine to address that. And then, you know, the third step's the easy part. That's where they show up in the gym and we start doing it. So, um our job today, right? We want to understand the importance of our subjective and objective pieces of information and how we use that to write programs. Uh we want to be able to navigate the entire fitness assessment process, obviously, we're going to look at it, like I said, from the youth angle, but like, uh, again, our priority is always to get you guys to pass your regular NASM. So there'll be some extra stuff in the notes that's not in the PowerPoints. Um, and understand any con special considerations for youth, because like, if you are training a kid, like, what are some of the considerations you got to make, you know? Um, how do you have to make some like specific like adjustments? So, you know, uh, if we're going through that, if we're talking about like the idea of a fitness assessment, right? Uh, you know, the goal of any personal training relationship is always to begin with an integrated assessment. And that way we can gather adequate data in order for us to be able to effectively train our clients, right? I can't write a program unless I know a little bit about how you move, right? Uh, like, Cody, you're dealing with like the ankle problem, right? So like, it's important for me like to write a program that he, that all takes that into account, but also like addresses it, right? Um, Kenny, we talked a little bit about like the, the, the tight hamstrings, right? Um, we got to write a program that is going to address that, right? And like, we can take advantage of your strengths. Like Kenny, one thing you've got going for you tremendously, your shoulders are not rounding at all. Like you've got a really good like pull back nature, like your arms don't fall forward. You're able to keep them in line with your ears really, really easily. There's not a lot of like lat tightness in there. So I can take advantage of that and I can beat up your lats, you know, <laughs> like I don't have to worry about them tightening up. It's great, right? Um, Charlie, we talked a little bit about the asymmetric shift. Uh, Dalen, I think it was tight calves, right? And then Andres, I think it was also tight calves. Uh, I'm trying to remember like all the the little pieces. Um, well, you know, I only get to see you guys like once every half, one and a half. What a good memory though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying. I don't know. Um, but like each of those things, right? Like everybody in this call has something like just a little bit different, right? Um, and so if that's the case, then we need everybody in here is going to get a program that's a little bit different. So uh, I always like to, to kind of pitch that really hard because like that's that's the difference between like your your clients being like, you know, saying like, yeah, they're a really good trainer. Like they're motivating, their workouts are hard. Yeah, they're not bad. 
right? Versus like, oh no, that person is like life-changing. Like you got to work with them. They know exactly how to break down what's going on with you. And like, I always feel so taken care of. And I always feel like they're really like, you know, putting their time and effort into like writing the best program for me. That's the stuff people attach to, you know? And I guarantee you that's, that's what has kind of like made my career successful is like my, you know, effort to ensure that everything is incredibly, incredibly personalized to my clients. Um, so if that is true, that's what we want to learn how to do today. And I know we've talked about this before in some classes. So some of you guys, this will be familiar. Uh, some of you guys, this will be a little bit new. But let's take a look at uh, what we're talking about with like a, a, a fitness assessment. It's going to be broken down into two major categories, our subjective information and our objective information. Um, and I tend to find that like trainers tend to be a little uh, heavy on the objective side. I mean, obviously, there's also a lot more objective assessments to be performed, uh, but I encourage you guys not to sort of disregard the subjective stuff or, or rush through it. Um, it is incredibly, incredibly valuable data, uh, even if it isn't stuff that you can measure and track progress in, right? Um, so fit, uh, we're gonna help us, bleh, fitness assessments are gonna help us establish our baseline values. They're also gonna help us understand our contraindications. You know, if we have a client who tells us they have uh, like a bone disorder, like let's say you have a client, you know, this is, we're talking about youths primarily, but Next mod, we'll talk about like seniors, if they tell you they have like osteoporosis, right? Um, osteoporosis doesn't mean you can't exercise with them, doesn't mean they can't lift weights because they super can, but do not put them on a foam roller because that is literally, you know, bending their bones that can cause like fractures, right? Um, and so, you know, our, our assessment is going to help us determine like our starting point and the path on which we are going to travel for progress. Um, so looking at subjective information, right? Uh, like I said, two major categories here. You can see subjective information is pretty short and then objective information is very, very long. Um, but subjective data, right? Subjective information is going to be any type of any information that cannot be measured. Okay. So this is valuable data, but it can't be measured, right? Um, like uh, if I, add, you know, subjective is, is, you know, it's, it's intangible, right? Like if I asked Charlie what his favorite movie is and, and Dalen what his favorite movie is, and I had to guess like who is more passionate about their favorite movie, right? I wouldn't be able to measure that. Like I have no data points to go on, right? It would just be kind of a gut feeling, right? Um, and that's not really, you know, going to, to be something that is very helpful in this situation, right? But subjective information can be very helpful to us as personal trainers. So if you have a client who tells you they sprained their ankle, right? They sprained their ankle uh, a year ago. So they've, they've been on the road to recovery for quite some time now. Um, you know, I don't know how that is going to actually affect you, right? Like, I don't know what type of effect that's going to have on your ankle stability, on like your glute strength on that same side of the leg. Like, I'm not going to have any idea um, what that really means, but I should take it into account when I'm writing my program, right? It doesn't mean that like I'm disregarding the information, right? It just means it's something that I'm going to keep in the back of my brain to like remember for when we, uh, when we go in, in, you know, onto the gym floor, right? So uh, subjective information can't be measured, but it is very, 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 very valuable. Your clients' likes and dislikes, your clients' uh, uh, goals, for instance, those are all very subjective. Um, so first thing we're going to look at is the PAR-Q. This is the Physical Activity Readiness Questionnaire. Uh, it's a series of questions related to the cardiorespiratory system primarily uh, that determines, and this is the big part, determines whether a client is ready for exercise or not. So if we go to nasm.org here uh, and we go down to their resources tab where they have some downloads here at the end, at the bottom, um, and we look at the PAR-Q, you can see, uh, you know, here are our seven questions. These are all very much related, like I said, uh, to the cardiorespiratory system, right? Has your doctor ever said they have a heart condition or high blood pressure? Yes or no? Uh, do you feel any chest, uh, chest yeah, pain in your chest during daily activities of living or when you do physical activity? Yes or no? Do you ever lose balance or dizziness or consciousness, right? Um, so 
all of those little questions right there, if they answer yes to any of those things, um, you know, we want to make sure they get like a doctor's note, a doctor's like permission uh, before they start exercising. That's just going to be uh, a really big part of, of ensuring that, uh, you know, we are, 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 are safe, like as the trainer, like we're not going to get sued um, for training this person. Uh, and also it's going to keep the client safe and ensure that like, you know, they're not going to, to do anything that puts their health at risk, right? So if a client answers yes to any of these questions, uh, make sure they consult a physician. You can see this is the updated version of the Park Q that's on NASM's website now. Uh, you can see it says, if yes, com uh, above complete pages two and three. And pages two and three, where we're going to see like a lot more detailed information. If our client uh, still says yes to any of that, honestly, it's one of those things where it's like, you know what, I want you to go ahead and go talk to your doctor uh, and come back and see me a little bit later, right? Um, so, uh, and if they answer, by the way, if they say no to everything, if they say yes to some of the stuff on here and they say no to the, some of the stuff on here, some of the, the new information they're putting out there is like following the general uh, pro, uh, uh, activity guidelines, right? 20 to 60 minutes, low to moderate three to five days per week until we are getting to that 150 minutes of, of moderate intensity. Um, so that's kind of an interesting one. It's like we work with our clients, we work with them in very a very limited capacity, right? Um, that's where, and we'll talk more about this later, but like this, that's where like single set systems, uh, which I've mentioned a couple of times, would actually work really, really, really well. Um, but if they said no, right, and they're like ready to go, they're like, yeah, no, I don't have any heart problems, right? All right, let's go kick their butt, you know, <laughs> like, like let's do this. Um, so that's that's your park queue. And for the most part, like your youths are going to say no to everything on this list. Um, very rarely, you know, in fact, I've, I've never seen it for sure. Um, I can't imagine a client saying yes to it. Like if they're, if they're like a small, a little youth, you know? Um, so that's your park you, right? Park you really, really important. Always do it. You know, even if your client was like, I mean, honestly, you are at a small amount of risk, right? If you had a client sit down at the desk, say yes to something on the park queue, like, yeah, I, I lose consciousness or like I have really bad chest pain. And then as they're going up the stairs before you even start working out, they had a heart attack, right? That might look very, they might try, you know, we don't know what people's reaction is going to be. We hope people are going to be kind and decent, you know, like that person should clearly draw the conclusion that what we're doing is not, you know, it's not their fault, right? That the, it's not our fault that they had a heart attack, right? But you never know. And so like, you want to make sure that you are legally protected. And that's what this document does. It protects you um, from any possible litigation in regards to like a client who does get injured, you know? Um, that's also what your certification does, by the way. This is why it's so important to be certified as a personal trainer when you're training clients. Um, and it's why we, we also have insurance, you know? Um, so uh, next thing we're going to look at is the general slash medical history questionnaire. So this is going to be questions about like a client's general history and a client uh, questions about their medical history, right? Um, it's a series of questions that help us paint a picture of a client's medical uh, and general background. So this is going to be... Um, you know, if we take a look at this, this is the, the new lifestyle and history assessment version, right? Uh, it's like, what activities do you usually engage in? Like in terms of like physical, like do, they, do you run, do you weight lift, do you do a group exercise? How many days per week do you get 60 minutes of activity? On a scale of one to 10, how important are these fitness goals to you? Like weight loss, muscle gain, sports performance, health performance, whatever. Uh, we got some questions about diet on here, which is really cool, right? Scale of one to 10, do you consider your diet healthy? Um, how would you rank your sugar intake on a, you know, high, medium, or low? Lifestyle questions, right? Do you feel like you get enough sleep? Um, how would you rate your levels of stress? Do you smoke tobacco or vape? Man, I cannot believe we're going to friggin' vaporizers showing up on, on official forms now. <laughs> I remember when vaping first came on the market and I was like, that's going to die in six months. No way are people going to be into that. We all know smoking is bad for us. And here we are. <laughs> um, 
All right. So then we got uh, occupation, right? What is your occupation? So this is this is probably the, the big stuff that's going to really translate. So what is your occupation? Uh, does your occupation require extended periods of sitting? That might not seem like a very important question. Um, but like when we ask questions like that, right, that's subjective information, right? Um, it's going to tell us a little bit about like, you know, possibly our client's posture, right? Um, like for instance, uh, you know, we've been over this before guys. What, uh, actually here, you know, we'll do it a different way. Uh, let's get everybody re-engaged. Pop quiz. Uh, <laughs> uh, what is the cause of an excessive forward lean? Excessive forward lean, what's, what's causing that? Hold on a second. Excessive forward lean, think about it. It's getting real quiet in here. I, this is totally not working. I was trying to do a bit where I pull up the sound of crickets. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, so excessive forward leans, right? When your client squats like this, right? They get up and they, they're doing their overhead squat, but their squat looks something kind of like this, where their butt sticks really far out and I'm barely bending my knees. I'm just hinging at the waist, right? It is really what I'm doing here, right? The causes for that, there's two. There's actually two causes here. Um, there is either going to be a very tight calf situation. So because their calves are so tight, uh, they can't bring their shin forward, right? They can't squat like this because that involves their shin coming forward in the angle I've got it here. Their ankle wants to stay like this. So that means that their shin's gonna be at 90 degrees, which means that as they squat, they're gonna fall backwards, right? So what they have to do instead is they have to stick their butt out and just hinge at the low back. And that will keep them from losing their balance. So that's one of the reasons for an excessive forward lean, but, it can also be caused by tight hip flexors that are actually pulling the body downward, or it could be caused by tight abdominals that are pulling the body downward. So that happens with extended periods of sitting. When you sit for long periods at a time, your muscles get used to being in this hip flex contracted position. So those hip flexors could get tight. Now, the other thing that could happen on the total flip side of it, right? also through extended periods of sitting, we could see that our client has maybe Instagram booty, right? Like they could have this really intense, like low back arch where they're sticking their butt out like crazy, right? Um, see how my pelvis is pointing straight down towards the floor here, right? We want our pelvis to be in sort of a neutral position where right? I'm trying to draw, trying to like use my sweatshirt to draw that angle, right? We don't, we see this, that's tight hip flexors. This neutral pelvis, right? This is posterior pelvis. We don't want that either. Um, but we see it like if the pelvis is being pulled down like that, that's because the body, they're sitting like this all day. Their hips are in a flexed position. So when they stretch them down, it pulls the pelvis this way because those muscles don't want to relax anymore. They're so used to contracting, they don't want to let go. So we learned a little bit about their posture from a subjective piece of questioning, right? Um, what about the same thing like here? What about, does your occupation require repetitive movements? If yes, explain, right? We know that rotator cuff muscles can get underactive because larger pressing muscles get overactive and that can reduce mobile mobility in the shoulder. Um, does your occupation require you to wear a shoe with a heel? You know, if you're in elevated heels all day, like, and by the way, this is not just like uh, our female clients, like men who are wearing dress shoes, dress shoes are extremely elevated heels. And honestly, I've started changing this in, in my life, like where I'm like, do you wear like basketball shoes all the time? Like, you know, like, let's look at like a friggin' modern shoe with the bubble, you know, the, the, the bubbles in the soles, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, th this is a, this is a Nike shoe, right? Like, which we think, means athletic right we think that like we look at a shoe like this and we're like oh surely this would be a shoe to like you know really be like active and fit in but you know honestly like this to me makes your posture worse 
you know, I'm not talking about like, you know, a lot of times I think posture is shoulders, right? But like, look at this elevated heel. Like, that's crazy. That puts you like into a high heel position all freaking day. So your calves never have to stretch out. And so we're just seeing like this, oh my God, what is that monstrosity? Oh, gross. Uh, <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> um, yeah, this is completely limiting you know, your client's range of motion, screwing up your calves. Um, I really do not like the bubble sole shoes. Um, if you've got them, I think they can be used as like a fashion freaking thing, but don't wear them all day. <laughs> um, so that's, that's an elevation. That's why we asked that question, right? Recreation, we want to know what our client thinks is fun. Medical, we want to know about any injuries they've had. Like if they said they had like a, uh, uh, like I said, a uh, sprained ankle or knee surgery or something like that. Uh, in the past, we want to know about it. If there aren't any medications, we want to know about it. Um, <laughs> and let me tell you guys, it, inevitably, inevitably, you will go through this whole process and you will have like a, a client who later is like, oh, well, I did have like knee surgery six months ago. And it's like, I asked, I asked so specifically. <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't think it mattered. It's like, <laughs> uh, all of them, every client. No, it's not all of them, but it is often. Um and then, uh, like I said, medications, and we want to know about what those medications are, which is why we have the information in your textbook. And then we just got some room for any additional notes here. So all of that information, all of that is going to, to help you design like a program that's going to help, you know, uh, avoid any contraindications due to the medications, uh, you know, rehabilitate after a past surgery, uh, and then, you know, participate in rec, you know, have fun by even participating in like sports and activities and things like that. So we want to do that with our youths. We want to do it with our, with our adults, seniors, like whatever, right? We just, we want to do this with every client. You should always, always, always be starting with a fitness assessment. It is, it is absolutely key information. Um, so, uh, oh, I think we lost Dalen. Oh no, not Dalen. Sorry. Who did we lose? Uh, we lost Charlie. Oh, we always lose Charlie. Yeah. I should start assuming him out, but, but that is big guy's connection sucks. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, next one we got is objective information, right? Objective information is information that can be measured. Okay. This is your, your very number based information, right? If I asked, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cody, what's your, what's your one rep max on the bench, right? You'd tell me a flat number, right? Um, if I asked, uh, you know, uh, if I were to, to measure, uh, like Dalen had you run like a one mile run and then measure what your heart rate is at the end of that mile, right. That is a hard number based piece of information. So, you know, uh, I could train both of you guys for a couple of weeks and then look for improvements in those things by running to you through the same assessment. It's like, Hey, your heart rate went down, right? Boom. The program worked. Hey, your bench press went up. Boom. The program worked. Right. So this is our objective information. It's typically number-based, although uh, your posture analysis is like uh, the overhead squat, the pushing and the pulling assessments, static posture assessments, those we don't slap a number on, but they are still like considered objective information. They are still very measurable, especially because if you wanted to, you could slap a number on them if you were to do like full on uh, like goniometry. Um, which is where you use this little angle here. You'll learn a little bit about uh, the basics of goniometry with Mo and, and Capstone, but basically you use this little angle here um, to, there, there we go. Uh, that's the picture I want. To measure like, you know, what the, the two segments of like a bone is. And you're looking for like normal range of motion. So for instance, if you look at this uh, elbow here, right? They're measuring elbow flexion. Uh, that is a, I think it's a, a, a little bit of a normal, I think that's normal elbow flexion, but you can see here that is excessive elbow extension. So this person's double jointed. Um, uh, so we can see like, you know, that kind of thing right there. Mm, not so much, right? That's a, that's a pretty normal angle. So, um, anyway, that's, that's, that's where like, if anybody ever wonders why, posture is part of objective information when everything is number-based except posture that's that's why 
Um, so this is going to be physiologic information like your heart rate and blood pressure, body composition information like your body weight, body circumference measurements, body fat percentage, your cardiorespiratory assessments like how well you perform if I put you through like a rigorous cardio exercise, uh, a posture assessment like how well you perform if I move you through a full range of motion, and performance assessments, which are the ones that kids are going to love, uh, which is like, hey, how is your performance, right? How many push-ups can you do in a row? Uh, how many sit-ups? Uh, <laughs> how much juice? Uh, like that's that's all uh, going to be like our assessments there related to to performance, right? So, um, like I said, physiologic assessments. We're going to break these into categories today. Let's take a look at physiologic assessments. First one is going to be heart rate. Now there are a million different ways that we use heart rate information, guys. Um, they, but remember, like at the end of the day, heart rate is the number of beats in 60 seconds, right? So one of the most important ones that we're gonna look at pretty quickly is the resting heart rate. Your resting heart rate is a client's heart rate while they are at rest. We know that a low resting heart rate is associated with a strong cardiorespiratory system, right? And the cardiovascular system. Um, we know that the lower your resting heart rate is, the stronger your heart is because it's pumping plenty of blood and it doesn't have to beat that often in order to do it, right? Like my resting heart rate, we're at about 68 beats per minute right now, which makes sense because I'm sitting upright, I'm kind of animated. Typical resting heart rate is anywhere from 70 to 80 beats per minute. We're gonna see that a little bit lower uh, amongst like Sochi people. Like I always warn people about that because like inevitably in class, we never get anybody who's like in the eighties. <laughs> uh, and people are like, uh, how come we don't have any, like why, why is our average very different? It's like, well, it's, it's a school full of people who are here to work out professionally. You know, <laughs> like it's not that surprising that everyone's heart is in pretty good shape. Um, so, you know, this number is gonna fluctuate. It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. If I stop talking even a little bit, the number will probably go down. If I relax into my chair a little bit, the number will go down um, until eventually it gets to a full true resting heart rate. So when you're taking this with your clients, you wanna make sure that you are measuring it, um, you know, while they are completely at rest and they've been sitting for at least a few minutes. Luckily, this is the first thing on our assessment list here. Um, so they just got done doing all their subjective information. You ask them a series of questions. So they've been sitting down the whole time. So it's actually a really convenient time to do this, right? So that's your heart rate rest or your resting heart rate. Now, the other thing you need to figure out is their heart rate. Ma Actually, I just realized, what am I doing? Uh, Nassim.org. <laughs> I just realized I wanted to like do this as we go through. Uh, downloads. Cardio assessment template. They changed this up ever so slightly, so I'm a little, yeah, there we go. All right, download. To the desktop. Open her up. Can I type? No. All right. Uh, that's okay. Let's close that and open it up. Is it this one? <laughs> yeah, can I type? Nah, whatever. All right, so um, if we were going through this, right, let's let's uh, let's put a client's name up here. That one. I've only done this a couple times. I'm not super great at this. <laughs> let's. All right, we'll say it's me, right? So uh, today is what this three nineteen twenty twenty one, right? So the resting heart rate, like I said, it's about seventy. I don't know. We'll say seventy beats per minute, right? Um, just for the sake of argument. Now, what we need to figure out next is our client's max heart rate, okay? So your max heart rate is, is just a simple little bit of math. Um, it is nothing, it's not exactly the most accurate uh, version of this, but it's an estimation of your client's maximum heart rate in order, we use it to determine exercise intensity. So if I said, uh, Andres, I want you to work out at 75% of your heart rate max, um, you know, uh, I just realized, Andres, how old are you? I don't know if you can actually hear me or respond, actually. Uh, what about you, Charlie? Charlie, how old are you? I'm 28. 28? Right. So that'd be 220 minus 28. So your heart rate max is 192. 
So if I wanted to give you like a heart rate range for you to do your cardio in, I'd say, hey, I want you to be between like 65 and 75 percent. So I'd say 192 times 0.65. That's 125. 192 times 0.75. That's 144. So I'd say I want you to somewhere between uh, 125 and 144 in terms of your heart rate, which is a pretty big range, right? Um, and it's also not very specific to you. Like already based on this data that I just gave you guys, it doesn't sound very customized, right? Like like everybody who's 28 years old gets the same cardio workout, you know, even if they are, you know, uh, if, they, if they're like a vet who works out like pretty frequently versus like somebody who's like a total couch potato, that doesn't sound very wise. And you're right. That's actually not the best way to determine exercise intensity, but we still need to know what that heart rate max is. So uh, for me, that's going to be 220 minus 32. So that's going to give me a max heart rate of 188. Okay. So I'm going to put that right there. Uh, and then blood pressure, uh, you know, um, last time I checked, it was 110 over 75. Uh, and that was a couple weeks ago. So I assume it's about the same. I don't know. It hasn't been particularly stressful lately. Uh, <laughs> so those are, you know, there's some, some information right off the bat, right? So that is our resting heart rate. Now, one other thing that you can calculate, and you'll actually see this a little bit lower down the assess, actually, we're not seeing it on the assessment here. Um, one thing that you definitely want to do, they're not, I can't believe they didn't put this on here. Um, is a much more accurate version of what your client's target heart rate zones are, okay? So this is where when we look at target heart rate, target heart rate is the heart rate target for a client in order to apply the appropriate level of stress. So when we look here, right, we see like, you know, we're rating our client as like doing poorly or excellently, right? Um, that is going to determine how intense of an activity we give our clients. Like, do we give them, you know, uh, like if I'm training Charlie, do I wipe the floor with him or do I take it easy to build him up first, right? Um, it's going to be important for me to know like which choices are going to be safe and effective for my client. And that's where target, you know, where, that's where cardiorespiratory assessments come in. Then once I know what is safe, I can create a target heart rate. So, you, you know, like I said, target heart rate, Lots of different types of heart rates here. The target heart rate is the heart rate target for a client in order to apply the appropriate level of stress. And so that is going to be target heart rate equals your max heart rate times your desired intensity. So like I just did with Charlie there, my desired intensity was 65% to 75%. So I took his heart rate max, I multiplied by 65, I multiplied by 75, boom, there's my range, right? I want you somewhere between here and here. Don't go over here, you know, that's too, uh, that's too easy. Don't go over here, that's too hard, right? Um, but like I said, it's not very specific. It's not very specific um, to our client in particular. And that is where we have a different formula called the Carvenin method, or sometimes referred to as the heart rate reserve formula, um, which is a formula to determine your target heart rate. But this one is based on the difference between your max heart rate, which is just your age, right? Um, do, you know, my heart rate, my, your, your 220 minus your age. Um, difference between your max heart rate and your resting heart rate. And if you're in really good shape, you're going to have a low resting heart rate. And if you are, you know, your heart's not in such great shape, you'll have a high resting heart rate. So this is going to be the difference between these two, right? This is where we're taking into account our individual client. So I want to show you what that looks like. You guys can go to this website here. Uh, if you go to briancalkins.com, um, resources. Oh no, I, I don't know why I did it this way. I just Google it. Uh, Carbon and calculator. <laughs> no, that's the new, that's a different one. There we go. There we go. So, uh, Brian, sorry, flash heart rate. So, this is the carbon and calculator that I've been using forever. So, like I said, I'm 32, right? Uh, resting heart rate says like 70 beats per minute. If I hit calculate here, you'll notice the old method. I don't know why this is, is quite like this. Let's see if I can. I copy this. <laughs> Actually, let's see if I can copy this whole thing. We'll pull this on to Microsoft Word. It'll be a little easier to see. Maybe. 
There we go. Except this disappeared. <laughs> All right, didn't work. <laughs> All right. Um, so you can see here, if we look at it, right, the old method, if I wanted to be between like 65 and 75 percent, my the old method, everybody who's 32 years old would be between 122 beats per minute to 141 beats per minute, right? It's not bad. Right, like I don't dislike that method. If that's all you have access to, you don't have time to like get their resting heart rate, use this. It can be very effective. But based on like the performance of a resting heart rate, we can see that the 65% here is very different than the 65% here. It's 147 beats per minute. That is like 23 extra beats per minute. That's pretty substantial 23 25 extra beats per minute <laughs> um that is a substantial difference right and we have 75 percent here that's going to go all the way to 159 so what's funny is like you know this range is 122 to 141 but this range is only 147 to 159 so it actually kind of limited it kind of made me have like a smaller window which we know means that it's being more specific, right? We like specificity. We wanna make sure we're giving our clients very specific workouts. So that's the carbon in formula. It's, it's much more accurate to your client in particular, and it's definitely the version that we prefer to do. Uh, the formula for that is gonna be your heart rate max, so that's the 220 minus your age, subtract your resting heart rate, then multiply it by your desired intensity, and you got to tack that resting heart rate back on at the end. Um, any questions on that, guys? I know we've been over this before, um, but I always like to review it. Questions? Has anybody in here tried this, by the way, since you've been learning about it? Has anybody like tried target heart rate training? Um, I haven't, honestly, I haven't. No. Give it a shot, man. I mean, it is kind of a pain in the rear if you don't have like a way of like, like you know, having to test your heart rate, like, you know, consistently and dial it in kind of sucks. It's it's honestly, it was my least favorite thing when it came to like cardio training back in the day. Um, but if you can, you know, get yourself like a, a heart rate monitor. Um with like the chest strap style by the way those are the really really good ones uh, okay. yeah i really i mean the chest straps it again it's kind of a pain in the butt to have to wear it but trust me it's much more accurate um and uh they're all really good this wahoo one uh the wahoo like ticker i don't know it's like 80 bucks it's, these are pricey whoa 31 dollars what um that's so cheap i wonder if that's any good fascinating uh anyway this wahoo one is very very popular i use the polar h9 this is the one that i have um but wahoo is really great because it syncs with like a lot of different apps so if you don't want to spend money on a watch that reads your heart rate monitor uh which is only going to cost you like a little bit more money um oh good there's an hr10 now um <laughs> uh if, uh, if you don't want to spend money on a watch, like the Wahoo ticker can go to an app and it can go, it can sync with like a lot of other pieces of, of stuff. So if you're into it, guys, I really recommend it. Um, for those of you who are thinking about taking their, their cardio, um, uh, a little bit more seriously, um, look into it. I really, I really do think it's super fun. Um, it's also just super fun to see yourself like perform better. You, you know, you run up the same hill that you did last time, but your heart rate's lower. You're like, that's awesome. Right. I gotta run faster. Um, and then we have blood pressure, right? Blood pressure is also a physiologic assessment. Uh, it's the amount of pressure on the arterial walls. Normal blood pressure is going to be anywhere around 120 over 80. In our youth clients, that's going to be a little bit lower. Um, remember, lower bodies, uh, smaller bodies, smaller blood pressure, right? So be aware of that. Uh, but our, our normal numbers that you need to have like in your head in case you ever get tested on them on your NASM, 120 over 80, okay? All right, next type of assessments that we got. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, minimize that. Next type of assessments we got are our body composition assessments, right? Um, so body composition assessments are where we are taking a look at uh, our client's overall body composition in relation to, um, uh, you know, their their body weight, their body circumference, their body fat percentage, uh, things like that, right? So uh 
we take a look at this, right? There's a couple different versions out there, right? Um, but all of them are body composition, right? Even calculating a client's BMI, that's body composition, right? Um, so uh, if we look at this, their weight, that's going to be their scale weight. Their body fat percentage is going to be the Le the amount of like body fat they have in comparison with their overall body weight, their body mass index, which is going to be their weight versus how tall they are, and their circumference measurements, which is measuring body girth, right? Like how, uh, how many inches around certain body parts are, right? So if we take a look at this, right? Uh, actually, sorry, right here. Um, and we did, oh, no, 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 buttons. <laughs> right, if we go here, right? Um, say uh, right uh so that's gonna be six foot oh shoot ah seriously so six foot one uh weight about 175 pounds today's date 3 19 20, 21. Uh, body mass index. So we got to calculate body mass index, right? Um, so that is going to be weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. I know I've said it a hundred bajillion times, but you do want to get it memorized. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit uh, and I'm going to do the, uh, the dumb American version uh, and we're going to do it in inches here. So six foot one, that is 73 inches. So 73 so 73 times 73, that's 73 squared. That's 5,329, uh, 175 pounds divided by 5,329 gives me this crazy number. So then I need to multiply it by that by 703. And that gives me a BMI of 23.08. So that's my BMI um, right there. Uh, again, should have done the imperial version if we're being real, you know, scientific about it. <laughs> um, then we got our circumference measurements, right? So we would measure uh, the neck at the Adam's apple, right? Uh, we would do the chest. Um, I don't really have like, a, you know, like I'm a guy, so these are pretty flat, right? <laughs> like, which means we're pretty much going to go right on the nipple line for most of your male clients. Uh, female clients, you're going to go with the first apparent flattening of the chest, right? Um, so you're going to go where you see like a crest end and it gets nice and flat. That's that's what we're measuring. Uh, the arms, you're going to do uh, halfway between the elbow and the shoulder. If you want to do it that way, NASM is going to recommend that you do the widest part of the bicep. Um, so I like both of those. I think those can totally both work. Uh, your hips are going to be at the... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, waist first. Your waist is going to be at the narrowest part of the waist. So as you view your client, you're going to look at the narrowest part of their waist. Uh, and then you are going to do their hips. You're going to go with the widest part of their hips. Um, so that is, you, we definitely always want to make sure we do it that way because we're going to see that in our waist to hip ratio just in a second. Your thigh uh, usually is 10 inches above the kneecap. If your client does not have 10 inches above their kneecap, make up a number, say six inches or whatever, right? Um, not everybody has 10 inches of, of, of femur. Uh, and then your calves are gonna be similar to the biceps that the widest circumference of uh, the biceps there. So you take a measurement once, you take a measurement again, and it's going to be plenty accurate. And when you are doing these, uh, you know, you guys have, some starter circumference uh, tape measures in your Sochi bags. Um, but I recommend if you ever want to upgrade getting something like this, which has like the little spring in it. And what you do is you actually feed this little like tab here into this little hole like that. And then it makes a loop. And then what happens is you hold and then you click this little button and it'll tighten it up. Um, I put this in backwards. <laughs> because I'm a professional. Uh, <laughs> God dang it. Uh, so you put that in there like that, and then you click this button here, uh, and then that will only pull so hard, right? So um, that way, like, I'm getting a consistent measurement every time. The amount of tension is determined by, you know, the spring, rather than me 
like measuring my client and like ripping it, you know, like pulling them too hard one session and be like, you lost six inches. That's great. Meanwhile, they're like suffocating. Right. And then the next time they come in, you don't pull very hard. And then suddenly they're like, it's like, oh, you gained some inches, right? Like that's yeah, very inconsistent and, and not great for data. Um, so that's also going to tell us our waist to hip ratio, right? So let's just say I, I got to look this up because I never know like inches off the top of my head. Uh, waist to hip ratio. Look up a picture here. All right, let's say we did uh, 75 centimeters. Uh, actually, you know what? Can I get, hmm, I want to say like two examples. <laughs> Actually, you know what? This picture is going to highlight what I want to talk about. So here we go, right? We go to the narrowest part of the waist and we go to the widest part of the hips, right? So narrowest part of the waist, widest part of the hips. Those are the two numbers that we are, are measuring, right? So let's say if we look at that, there we go. Thank you. Um, no, actually, sorry. I wanted fake numbers. We'll go back up here. Let's say we did that and it was, uh, and they're doing this in centimeters because they're smarter. Uh, 75 centimeters, right? And then in the hips, it was uh, 90 centimeters. So we would take 75 divided by 90. And that would give us 0.83 on our waist to hip ratio. So that would be a very good waist to hip ratio uh, for what we are looking for. For for your, you know, if that was me, actually, that'd be pretty freaking skinny for me. But like, if it were me, right? Um, that would put me, you know, below 0.9, uh, 0.91, which is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, God, where is the standard numbers? Um, there we go. Good Lord. Um, and actually those are not quite the numbers I'm looking for. <laughs> there we go. So that'd be like below 0.95, uh, which is exactly what we're looking for, for our, our male clients, right? Uh, our female clients were looking to go below 0.8. Women have like a slightly lower number here, guys, because uh, women have naturally wider hip bones. So just be aware of that, right? So this would be very healthy for me, but would actually be considered a little bit in the higher range if uh, it was a female client, right? Um, so that is your waist to hip ratio. Uh, that does still uh, apply to our youths, but generally, uh, you know, youths are, we're, we're, we're kind of calculating that out just for circumference measurements if they want it, right? Um, a lot of youth clients are not really interested in that. And a lot of times their parents aren't either. They're really just trying to get like slightly more active. But if you have a client, a, a youth client who really is trying to lose weight, these circumference measurements are another piece of data, right? Remember the value of like all these assessments, all these assessments coming together, the reason we have so many of them guys, is because the more pieces of data that you have, uh, the more information that you can like draw conclusions upon. So if your client's scale weight stays the same one week to the next, and all of a sudden they start getting down on themselves, you can look at their circumference measurements and be like, hey, hey, yeah, your weight didn't, you know, your weight increased or it stayed the same, but look, all of your circumference measurements are going down. This is an improvement, right? Uh, next thing we've got is our body fat percentage. So NASM has a couple, there's a couple different ways you can do body fat percentage. One is the skin fold caliper, which is going to help you determine your body fat percentage by using uh, subdermal fat by pinching it. Basically um, it's the subcutaneous fat, right? So it's the, the amount of fat trapped underneath our skin. So you are going to uh, pinch in four sites, although this is actually doing the, uh, the eight site method here, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Um, NASM is going to use what's called the Dernan Walmersley formula. Let's not pay attention to this over here, actually. Um, that is the biceps, uh, the triceps, just below the scapula on the upper back, and just above the hip bone on the front. So you total all those up, you look in the table, and it will tell you what your client's body fat percentage is. Um, it's not bad. It's actually shockingly accurate but generally the most convenient accepted way to calculate body fat percentage is through bioelectric impedance which is going to determine body fat percentage by sending an electric current throughout the body and we know that if that current travels really slowly 
then there is some type of tissue that does not conduct electricity very well. That's going to be body fat tissue, right? Um, so the slower the signal travels, the, the higher the body fat percentage. And so the machine's going to know that and recognize that. And then it will tell you what their body fat percentage is. Um, after we get that, we can figure out what our client's lean mass is, right? So let's say, let's go back to this one here. Let's say we did body fat percentage and mine came out to, let's say 18%, I don't know. So we'll say 18%, right? Um, for the body fat percentage here. So that's within like normal healthy ranges. Um, you know, for men, we want to be anywhere between like 10 and 20%. Uh, it's a little bit on the higher range, right? Um, so now we take my scale weight of 175 pounds and we multiply it by 18%. So times 0.18, that means that I have 31.5 pounds of fat in this scenario, right? Um, so now I can figure out what my lean mass is by taking 175 minus 131.5. I've had this times 175 <laughs> uh, minus, uh, oh my God, uh, minus 131.5. So um, that means that. Uh, that is giving me an over, oh my God, 175. I'm sorry, I totally screwed this up. Times 0.18, I hate this. 175 minus 31.5. I did 131.5. <laughs> minus 31.5. That means a lean body mass of 143.5 pounds and a body fat mass of 31.5 pounds. So that's how we calculate that out. And then we can calculate this again. Let's say, uh, in a couple of weeks, I do my scale weight, uh, you know, I've been working with my trainer for a little bit, trying to gain as much muscle as possible. Right. And now my scale weight is 174 pounds. It's like, oh, that sucks. My body weight went down. I'm trying to gain weight right now. Right. Uh, I'm on a gainer routine. Why did I lose a pound? Right. So now I weigh 174 pounds, but we take my body fat percentage and it comes down to uh, 17%, right? So times 0.17, that's going to mean 29 and a half pounds of fat, right? So if we take uh, 29 minus 174, unbelievable. <laughs> times 0.17, 29.58. I'm just going to open up a different one. Uh, 174 minus 29.58. So that's going to be a lean body mass of 144.42. So that went up by a little bit, like about, about a pound, right? This went up by about a pound, right? Just maybe a little under. Um, so it's like, hey, yeah, you did uh, lose like a pound of weight, but you gained a pound of muscle and lost close to two pounds of fat. See the difference there? This is why this stuff is so valuable. And all it is, just like a little bit of calculations. Now, like I said, for the most part, guys, we have like bioelectric impedance scales that kind of do all this fancy math for you pretty quickly. Um, so you won't really have to like actually do a lot of these calculations or a lot of these numbers. Um, but this is another point of data that you should totally get familiar with measuring because it's just another way to like make your, if you get a client who's like gets really down on themselves, this can be a way to like kind of dig them out of that because you are showing them progress. So bioelectric impedance measures fat through an electric current. Skin fold measurements uh, do it because of uh, measuring like um, your uh, subcutaneous fat and skin folds, right? Um, so next category we've got, we've got our cardio assessments. So uh, you'll notice I put the main ones in here for our adults, even though those actually are not going to be in the youth version. So uh, there is the YMCA three minute step test, which is a cardio assessment uh, that involves stepping onto a 12 inch box or a 12 inch step uh, for three minutes at a time and going in a tempo of 96 steps per minute. So that means like, look at how many variables we're controlling here, right? We know that it's exactly three minutes. We know that it's exactly 96 uh, steps per minute. Uh, and we know that it's a 12 inch step, 
right? Every single time. So because of that, right? Because it's a 12 inch step, 24 steps for a 96 total, right? Um, for three minutes, right? We know exactly everybody who's ever taken this assessment has done the exact same number of steps as everyone else. So then once we know that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure how well our client performs in relation to how well like someone should be able to perform, right? So what we're gonna do, if we look at this, Oh, that's a whole bunch of people doing it all at once. So what's happening is right there, all they're all like doing the steps, right? They're all going at the same pace, up, up, down, down. They do it for three minutes straight. At the end of that three minutes, they turn, they sit down immediately, and then the trainer is going to take their pulse and they are going to record it for a full 60 seconds. Do not measure it by like six seconds and then multiply by 10. Don't do 15 seconds, multiply by four. Measure it for a full 60 seconds because what we're measuring is not what their heart rate is at the end of the assessment. What we are measuring is what their heart rate is one minute after the assessment, right? We want to know how well their heart rate is recovering. If their cardiorespiratory system is in really good shape, their heart rate is going to do something like this. It's going to get back to a normal rhythm, right? Versus like if their heart rate really is just not recovering, they're going to be sitting there and they're going to be breathing and it's just going to keep going fast the whole time. So the higher the heart rate is after the assessment, the worse in shape our client is performing cardiorespiratory wise. So that's a really, really, really great assessment that we really like um, because it's a great, very convenient way to do it. Now, it is high impact. If you have a client who's relatively heavy, um, stepping onto a step like that might not be appropriate. But this is going to help us determine our client's cardio starting point by measuring how their heart rate returns to normal after exercise. We also have the Rockport walk test. Um, Rockport walk test is a one mile walk that is going to estimate your client's VO2 max. So you are going to measure how long it takes them to walk one mile. So the distance is the same, but everyone's time is going to be different. Uh, you're going to measure what their heart rate is the second the test is over. This is not a recovery pulse. You can do it for six seconds and multiply it by 10. You just want to know what their heart rate is the minute they hit that one second, the, the second they hit that one mile mark. Um, so it is after one mile, what their heart rate hit, gets up to, right? Uh, and you're going to uh, measure their age, their gender, what their body weight is, right? Um, and all of those things are going to go into this big complicated formula that is going to estimate how much oxygen they are consuming. So we are going to actually estimate their VO2 max. So if we look at like a, a Rockport walk test calculator, right? So let's say we had a client who is female, 39 years old, 210 pounds, and their heart rate was 131 at the end of the assessment, and it took them uh, 14 minutes and uh, 38 seconds to complete, right? So that's going to put them in the average category. Their VO2 max is about 33. That's pretty good, right? So that puts them right in the middle. I would give them a pretty normal workout, right? But let's say it took them like a minute longer, 15 minutes. Let's say their heart rate was 10 beats higher, 141, right? <clears throat> so now if I calculate that, that puts them in the fair category. So they didn't do quite as well right? They were struggling a little bit more. Let's leave the 15 minutes alone, but now let's say their heart rate was 161. We're going to jump it up by 20 beats, right? That's going to give them a VO2 max of only 25. That puts them in the poor category. They really didn't do very well. We need to be very gentle with this person. So in the first scenario, uh, I might give them a pretty standard cardio routine, but in the second scenario, maybe even, you know, introduce some interval training. In the second scenario, I'm going to be really, really gentle with my client. I'm really not going to push them very hard. My job is to develop their foundation so that I can build them upon that later, right? Uh, now, with youths, uh, we have some youth-specific ones here, which really aren't youth-specific. You can totally do this with adults if you wanted to. Um, 
this is much more looking at cardiorespiratory endurance more so than it is looking at heart rate. So that actually is a test question, if I remember right, in, in tomorrow's homework. Um, our, for kids, our cardio assessments are not so much about like their cardiorespiratory like recovery or anything like that. We just, you know, we assume youths are going to have healthy hearts, you know. Um, what we are measuring instead is how much endurance they have, right? Um, so there is a one mile run, there's the half mile run, there's the quarter mile run. You can do whatever distance you want, but you're going to have measure step one, start running, <laughs> right? And there really is no step two. You're just going to measure how long it takes for them to complete that one mile run. If you want to get their heart rate at the end of it, you can, but honestly, that's not really what we're assessing. We are assessing their endurance, right? The more endurance they have, the more they're able to keep up their fast pace through the whole mile. So that's really what we're measuring there. Um, when was the last time anybody in here did like a mile, like a mile like test? Six years ago. What do you, what do you mean like a mile test? Like how fast we run it in? Yeah, you have you done that in a while? Uh, not no, no, I don't. Cause I, why it's rare when I run a mile. I always try to do more than two miles when I run. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> I hear that. It's fun though. It's a. Uh, I encourage my clients to do all the time because it's kind of funny. It's like what I've noticed, this is totally just what I've noticed, by the way. This is not a lesson or anything. Um, I've noticed that like adult clients, you take them like they, everybody was so excited, like after they graduate from school to not have to do fitness assessments anymore, you know, uh, and they're all like, oh, I don't have gym class anymore. And I'm, you know, nobody's pushing me to, to run the mile. You know, I'm not doing laps anymore. And then like they're out of out of that for a few years. And I will like say, like, hey, it was last time you like tested your mile run. It's like Psh, not since high school. Like it was 20 years ago, right? It's like, you want to do it? And they're like, I kind of do. <laughs> you know, like they're kind of curious. It's it's funny. Like as we get older, we kind of come back uh to wanting to know, like, you know, it's it's a fun, like competitive thing that you can kind of test yourself on. And it takes very little equipment, it's very easy to do, you know. Um but yeah, if you get a chance, uh, you know, try it out, guys. It's kind of fun. <laughs> test your quarter mile run, test your half mile run. It's it's a blast. Um, all right. So then another category that we've got uh, that is going to measure. Uh, this is this is where this gets a little interesting. We are going to measure um, youth style strength assessments. I put these under the performance category. Personally, I consider these performance assessments. Um, so I'm actually going to leave this alone for just a second. But in our normal NASA, and I think we see it at the end here. Yeah, performance assessments, right? Um, we have what is called the Davies test with our with our adults and, and with youths, right? Which is an upper body agility assessment. So I'm actually gonna have a hard time like showing this to you guys here on camera, but if I go, you should be able to see me. So basically you're gonna set up um, a piece of tape 36 inches apart. So that's three feet, right? Um, two pieces of tape and your client's hands go in that, they go into a push-up position with feet together. They reach over and touch one hand to the other. And then they reach over and touch one hand to the other. And they go back and forth as fast as they can. And you're going to measure how many touches they can get in 15 seconds, OK? And so it measures upper body agility because it's measuring how quickly you can kind of transfer from one space to the other, right? Um, there's also the shark's skill test, which is a lower body agility assessment uh, where you actually have them jump into a nine by or a three by three grid. Um, video of this one because <laughs> I don't have a nine by, a three by three grid. I click shopping <laughs> videos. <laughs> um, so it looks like this. I will say this guy's boxes are way too big. Um, unless this is just, he's a little person, but uh, these boxes are massive. Um, so what you're going to do is you have the, the boxes are normally one foot by one foot square. That looks like honestly two feet by two feet. But this is the sequence you have them going. They stand on one leg and they jump from box to box to box in this sequence. Uh, and you're going to measure how long it takes them to complete that sequence. So 
time done, right? Uh, they do it on both legs. So it's measuring directional change for the lower body, just like uh, the Davies test measures the upper body agility, right? Um, mm -hmm. So back and forth like that, right? Those are both really good assessments. Um, and they're performance assessments, right? There's no normal table that you should, you know, there's no normalized time that you should be able to complete. It's just you versus you in the future, you know? We're gonna do this now, we're gonna do it again in four weeks. Let's see if you improve, you know? Um, but with our youths, you can do those, right? Um, but the other types of performance assessments, um, sorry, not with youths, don't worry about that. <laughs> the other type of performance assessments that we have are also what I mentioned earlier, what's your one rep max on the bench? What's your one rep max on the barbell squat? What about the deadlift? What about the military press, right? Your one rep maxes, again, there's no normalized table that you should be able to hit. It's just you versus future you. So that's a performance assessment, right? You're just measuring performance. There's no normal number you should be able to hit. Um, now with youths, we typically don't do the heavy one rep max testing unless it's like a, a late stage adolescent. Um, but we have three really fun versions of this <clears throat> that we're going to do instead. One is the 90 degree push up test. And that is however many push ups you can do by perform like maximal number when you go every three seconds. Okay. Um, so it's one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. That's one rep. So down, down, down. Right, so you actually wanna kind of set like a timer. Uh, you can do like a metronome if you wanted to do this. Uh, you can use like the metronome app. I, can it go down to 20? No. Uh, 20 beats per minute metronome. So this is what it would kind of sound like. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> So slow. <laughs> so here's the thing, man. Like that slow push up gets a little rough by the end of it. <laughs> like we do this, uh, we used to do this in, in Sergio, we do it in class, which is really fun. Um, but after a while, you're like shaking like crazy because you're moving kind of slow. Um, but that is the the maximum number of push-ups, right? Uh, one rep every three seconds, as many as you can do. You versus future you, right? Uh, we also have the curl up test, which is a sit up test, and that's how many push how many sit ups can you do in one minute's time? So you set a sixty minute timer, hit start. They're going to do as many as they can in one minute. Uh, and then there is the standing long jump test, which is a two legged a uh, long jump where, you know, two legs, you jump as far forward as you can measure the distance that they travel. They're super fun. They're super engaging. I will still do these with my adult clients, by the way, and these are actually really fun, but these are three that are not in your regular textbook uh, that are an absolute blast to try to perform uh, with your youth clients. And it gives them something to work towards, right? It's like, we're going to do this and we're going to look for improvements over time. Um, when we meet next week, uh, I'm sorry, not next week, but next next week, <laughs> um, say three, four, 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 four. Uh, on Tuesday, right? We'll meet on Tuesday the thirtieth. Uh, we are we'll we'll do some of these assessments just for fun. We'll have like a little class competition. It'll be a good time. Um, all right. Uh, next one we've got posture assessments. So posture assessments, right? Um, this probably the most important, or at least uh, the one that gives us the most like data for actually really writing our programs. Um, so your posture assessments, posture is basically how efficient you are at moving through like a full range of motion, right? It's the resting uh, position of your joints. So we have five main kinetic chain checkpoints that we're gonna pay most of our attention to. We're gonna look at the foot and ankle complex, the knee complex, the hips, the shoulders, and you can't see, they're not circling in here, but the cervical spine, okay? Those are the four spaces we're looking at. Foot and ankle, knees, lumbopelvic hip complex, shoulders, head, and cervical spine, right? 
Um, once we look at those, we're going to learn a little bit about like what's going on. So the first assessment we're going to do, and this is the kind of the king of assessments here, is the overhead squat assessment, right? This is a fitness assessment in which our clients squat with feet shoulder width apart, toes pointing straight forward, uh, and arms elevated with their biceps in line with their ears from the side. This will assess their dynamic flexibility, right? Which means like their flexibility as they move through a full range of motion, their core strength, if they have a weak core, their, their spine might move in the wrong way. It'll assess a little bit of their balance and their overall neuromuscular control. Are they controlling the right muscles at the right time? So, uh, if we look at this, I'm going to show you just a brief little video here. Um, so, uh, yeah, we haven't done arms fall forward in a while. So let's take a look. This video is going to kind of break down for us um, what it means when a client can't hold their arms up during the overhead squat. lateral view in our overhead squat assessment, one of the common compensations is to see the client's arms falling forward. As we squat, we should be able to maintain our arms directly overhead or in line with our torso. So to set up for this, we'll begin by aligning the five kinetic chain checkpoints. Be sure the feet are positioned hip width apart and straight. Be sure the knees are in proper alignment. Be sure we have the neutral position in the hips. And then we'll reach both hands all the way overhead all the way overhead. We notice that she already has a little bit of trouble getting them all the way up there. So there's a really good chance this may be a common compensation for her. Now we'll perform three to five squats down to the height of about a normal chair. So as soon as you're ready, we'll lower down and we'll immediately start to notice. Can you go any lower in that squat? We'll immediately start to notice how those arms fall forward and we'll just do one more and stand all the way up and stop right there. So notice here in her ending position, See how much further her arms have come forward. So we can see there, she's not maintaining them way back where that starting position was. So her common compensation here is the arms falling forward. Now for our overactive muscles, you could turn the face there. Our overactive muscles are going to be the pecs. This would be both the pec major and the pec minor. The pec minor is going to run right here in the shoulder from the coracoid process down to ribs three, four, and five, which is in an angle towards the midline of the body. And then the pec major runs that way as well. Whenever these become overactive, that basically means they're mechanically shortened and they're going to pull that shoulder into this forward position. When that happens, she's not able to maintain her hands all the way up above her head. In addition to that, the latissimus dorsi can also become overactive. So we'll do one more little turn here. We have the latissimus dorsi that's overactive. And now the lat runs from the anterior portion of the shoulder, runs right through here and attaches or clips the inferior angle of the scapula down into the spine and attaches to part of the hips. So if we go ahead and raise up here, what we can see, if that lat is shortened, she has a really tough time getting her arm into full shoulder flexion. And what we can really see in her, notice the position here of her back. And as she reaches up, we can see how that position changes. So it tells us the lats are probably short and overactive. Now for our underactive, the muscles that are not doing their job, they're going to be positioned here in the back. So we'll rotate again. So what we really see being underactive whenever the arms fall forward is the mid and lower traps. Now these are two muscles that attach here to the scapula and they run down at an angle towards the spine. What they really assist with is stabilizing and controlling the motion here of the scapula. So if we ask her to take her hand here to the side, slowly begin to reach up, we can see that the scapula here is supposed to rotate. The mid and lower traps help to control that motion. If they're not able to stabilize the scapula in that position, then we'll see that those arms fall forward. You can go ahead and relax there and turn and face. So in the lateral view, one of the common compensations we see is the arms fall forward. The overactive muscles in that movement compensation is going to be the pec major, the pec minor, and the latissimus dorsi. The underactive muscles are going to be the mid and lower traps, as well as the rhomboids that sit there in between the shoulder blades and assist with that stabilization. So uh, he moves through that pretty quickly, but like what we're talking about, right? During the overhead squat, if we see uh any of these compensations that we're about to go over we know which muscles are overactive and underactive so let's say we see a client who's 
feet flatten like this, right? They're gonna kind of flatten down. You can see like right here, um, they're kind of grinding the inside part of their foot uh, inwardly like that, right? That foot flattening posture, you know, they are everting their foot away. Um, but we call that general a little bit of pronation. You can see it also kind of happens with a little bit of like external rotation of the foot there. So we're seeing sort of a combo movement here, right? Um, and so that's pronation of the foot. That is going to be from underactive muscles actually up the kinetic chain at the hip. The hip is having a hard time driving the knees outward. Uh, and at the same time, the feet are having a hard time like stabilizing. So we're seeing like this kind of thing. That should be a little easier to see. Yeah, there we go. So uh, if I stand like right over here, right, you can see if I flatten my feet down like this, right, look what happened to my knees. My knees also inwardly rotated and caved in, right? And now I'm sitting on the inside part of my foot rather than sitting balanced on my foot like this. Now, if I take my shoes off, you can even see it a little bit better, right? So if I go here, right, and I flatten down like that versus like when they are in a normal position like this, right? So that's what we're looking for. We want to have like a nice even distribution of the foot. We also don't want to see this kind of thing where someone's feet turn away, right? Um, usually that's also associated with flattening, but when we see the foot like this where the feet are turning, that is also telling us that we have certain muscles that are overactive. So how do we know which muscles are overactive? Well, all we have to do is look at our muscle actions uh, to understand that, right? Like what muscles rotate the foot outward, right? That's gonna be the outside part of my gastric nemus, my calf muscle, right? So we're gonna go over more of this next module when we get into kinesiology, but if we look, which is actually only a couple weeks away, um, but if we look at like, if you look at our overhead squat solutions table, this will actually have our list for what it means when our muscles are overactive and underactive. So this is the, the picture, this is the table that's in your textbook. So if we see the feet turning out, the muscles that are tight and overactive are the soleus, right? That's your, your short calf muscle at the very bottom. Uh, your lateral gastric nemus, that's the outside portion of your calf and your biceps femoris short head, which is a muscle I freaking tore lately. But like that is this little tiny hamstring muscle that runs from the middle of your thigh down to just on the outside right here, right? And it's in charge of this motion. So, you know, it is in charge of literally turning my foot this way. And that's why we see like feet turning out is actually, it's a hamstring problem in addition to being a lateral calf problem and a uh, distal calf problem, right? So we see uh, tightness in all of those muscles. So if we've got a client whose feet are turning out, we need to straight, uh, stretch out their calves like crazy. We need to stretch out that biceps femoris short head. Now their underactive muscles are all the opposites of these things, right? Um, on the opposite side of the lateral gastric nemus, you just move straight over, you have your medial gastric nemus, right? Um, so we need to strengthen the inside portion of the calf. No more uh, calf presses like this, but we could probably do them like this and that might have a positive effect, right? Uh, their medial hamstring complex, right? That's the inner portion of the hamstring. You know, uh, you can spot someone with an overactive biceps femoris. Um, you'll even see it in like demos because like people don't even, people don't really realize, people don't realize they're doing it. Um, let's see if we can find, I'm going to look up a picture, a couple, uh, a couple of videos of someone doing hamstring curls. Let's see if we can find one. Let's see how this lady does. So actually she's doing a little bit of our, like notice how she's actually got some inward rotation to her feet here. Do you see how her feet are actually kind of facing each other? She's inverting actually, instead of everting. Um, now let's see what happens during the contraction. Yeah, okay, see that outward angle right there? 
see how like she's turning her foot this way? That's that biceps femoris short head on the lateral outside portion of the thigh that's actually contracting a little bit compared to, you know, if her toes were in alignment. So if we were training this client, we don't want to strengthen that biceps femoris. We want to strengthen the medial hamstring. So we would encourage them to make sure that they are keeping their toes pointing forward while they're doing their hamstring curls. And that way we activate the middle hamstring instead of the lateral hamstring. And then we also see the gracilis, sartorius, and popliteus, which are all stabilizer muscles. So one of the other ways that we can make this problem better, especially like if you have like a foot turnout situation, this is where you are going to benefit like crazy from balance exercises, learning how to like stand on one leg, move through full ranges of motion, right? Doing like lifts and chops and things like that you know, single leg chest presses, single leg rows, right? All of that kind of stuff that keeps you on one foot is a great way to strengthen those stabilizers and give you the neuromuscular control you need to keep those feet in alignment. So that is very, very important. So we can see like uh, what's some sample, you know, strengthening exercises, the single leg balance with reach, right? That's a great exercise to sort of address this problem. Meanwhile, we would stretch with these techniques right here. Uh, so let's move through the rest of these a little bit more quickly. Um, we are also going to see the knees caving in, right? Knees caving in, uh, during the overhead squat or during the single leg squat, by the way, is going to be very, very overactive or tight adductor muscles. Obviously the knees are adducting. So that makes sense, right? Um, so we see knees cave in, the adductor complex. We also see that biceps femoris short head again, uh, which always kind of surprises people because it's on the list twice here, but you can see the foot is externally rotating, right? It's doing that contraction that we just mentioned that that part of the hamstring likes to do. So that lateral hamstrings being the bad guy again, right? So see the knees caving in like that uh, and the feet turning out. Uh, we see the TFL, your tensor fascia latte, which is this little, uh, muscle up here in the hip that runs from your, uh, your ASIS over to the greater trochanter of your femur. Um, it's the knob on your hip that runs to the knob on the other part of your hip. Sorry, the knob on the front of your hip that runs to the knob on the side of your hip, like almost like next to your butt. Um, so that little short muscle right there, which is a hip flexor, but also an external rotator, which is what we're seeing down here, right? We're seeing that external uh, rotation, right? Uh, and then where are we at? Knees cave in. Uh, the vastus lateralis, which is actually the lateral uh, quad muscle right on the outside here. Again, notice how it's all the stuff like the TFL, which runs, you know, it's running down, it becomes the IT band and grabs here, the biceps femoris, which grabs on the outside here, and the vastus lateralis, which also grabs on the outside here. It's all the muscles on the outside of the thigh that is just really, really, really tight. And it's pulling into rotation rather than just relaxing uh, and letting us move through a full range of motion. So that's why, meanwhile, the adductors are actively pulling the knees this way. So we're seeing the knees cave in. Uh, so what do we need to do? We need to strengthen the exact opposite, right? We need to strengthen the outside of your gluteus medius, right? That's the outside of your butt that does abduction, uh, your gluteus maximus, which does hip extension and external rotation. We're internally rotating, so we want to get better at externally rotating. We're adducting, so we want to get better at abducting. Uh, and the vastus medialis oblique, or your VMO, which is a knee stabilizer on the inside portion. This is the, uh, your VMO is that teardrop on your quad. <laughs> I always think of, uh, whenever I think of the VMO, this is going to be weird, but like, uh, the, the mental image that I always have is that training montage from Rocky IV uh, <laughs> for Ivan Drago training montage. <laughs> Friggin' Dolph Lundgren had the freaking craziest quads in that movie. Uh, I feel like that is like, I always picture it when I'm talking about the VMO because um, this dude's quads were nuts. Where's he on that leg extension machine? <laughs> is it towards the end of it? Oh no, I didn't see it. Slower. 
Also, can we talk about how this is the greatest training montage in movie history? <laughs> yeah, okay, here we go. It's like, uh, there's doing external rotation. Here's the part where he's like on the quad machine. There it is. Like, this dude's quads are out of control. You can see, like, that's his VMO. He, I guess the camera doesn't have it, but like right there at the freaking kneecap, it's insane. I remember just being like, that dude's freaking like quad is bigger than my waist <laughs> um fun fact about Dolph Lundgren by the way uh just side note while we're here uh he is a uh uh, uh a literal rocket scientist um like he is literally like on and he's like a he's like a Mensa level like genius um which is really funny because he became a action movie actor <laughs> um all right, so next posture assessment we're going to look at. So we've looked at the ankle. Um, now we've moved up to the knee. Now we are going to move up to the low back, the lumbopelvic hip complex. We're going to look to see, do they have an excessive low back arch? If they do, the muscles that are pulling too hard are going to be the hip flexor complex, like I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, they get used to sitting. So then like as they drive their knee down, that causes the pelvis to tip forward, right? Um, so that's the hip flexor complex. That is going to be that TFL muscle we mentioned earlier, uh, as well as like your rectus femoris, right? Which is the really, really big one. Uh, and your psoas, which is running up here in your hip, right? Um, then we are also going to see the erector spinae here. That is the uh, the muscles that run along your low back that actually pull your spine this way. So you know, with the 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 hip flexors being tight, the low back is trying to pull at the exact same time, and that's what's causing this rotational movement to happen in our hips, right? My low back pulls up, my hip flexors pull down, and so it rotates the pelvis, tips it forward, right, like a bucket of water. Um, and then the lats, which actually do at attach to the, the low portion of your back. If you look at your thoraco, what's called your thoracolumbar uh, fascia, it's all of this white fascia down here uh, that's attaching to the back of your pelvis, right? Uh, and it's where your lats come down. So this is your lat muscle here, and it becomes all this fascia right here. So it's attached to the back of the pelvis. Meanwhile, the erector spinae, which is running like right here, is pulling the pelvis up. Thoracolumbar fascia starts doing that as well. So your latissimus dorsi is also really tight, right? Um, kind of like we saw in the in the video. Uh, the other one we've got is an excessive forward lean, right? We see somebody who leans really far forward. Uh, and this is where, like I said earlier, there are two causes to this. It could be uh, tight calf muscles, right? Like the soleus and the gastrocnemius, or it could be tight hip flexor muscles that are pulling you downwards, but it's also sometimes a tight abdominal complex. So Kenny, we were just talking about this the other day, right? Um, we mentioned how uh, you've got that little bit of excessive forward lean where your abs are pulling you downwards. And I was like, no more crunches. Like you're banned from crunches for the next couple months, <laughs> right? We need you to do more movements where you're pulling your back this way. So like Superman's, uh, and things like planks, bird dogs, side planks, all of those things are going to be really big for strengthening your, uh, your core to get you to stabilize rather than crunch forward. Um, so that's the abdominal complex being overactive, you know, what a weird problem to have, right? Like we talk about like, uh, what, you know, overactive abs, you know, we're constantly trying to strengthen people's abs. Well, these are the mover abs, right? These are the mo abs that move your spine. We want to strengthen the stabilizer abs that hold your spine in place. And then, like I said, weak muscles are going to be the, uh, on the opposite side of that, right? With the low back arch, that's going to be the gluteus maximus, right? That's going to, uh, that, you know, the, the hip flexors do hip flexion, your glutes do hip extension. They're literally exact opposites. Um, for the hip flexor complex, um, you definitely want to strengthen, uh, definitely want to strengthen that glute. And then we see the erector spinae here, right? Um, the low back needs to be strengthened in order to draw you upright again. Uh, in the excessive forward lean version, that is. And then we have arms fall forward, which I'll move through uh, pretty quickly because that's what we saw in the video, right? Arms fall forward, we see tight lat muscles that are pulling the arms down. We see tight pec minor muscles and tight pec major muscles. And we see weak uh, rhomboids and low trap muscles in order to pull 
those arms upright. Um, so that's the overhead squat. We've also got the single leg squat, which you can see here on the, on the right-hand side, uh, where we do the same thing. The only difference here is during the single leg squat, we aren't looking at overall body posture. We're just testing the core strength and balance. Uh, if your client's knees cave in, it means the same thing as when it caved in during the overhead squat. So that one's actually the same for the most part, um, but it is another assessment that we wanna perform. So we have another point of data. Maybe your client crushes it on the overhead squat. So we give them the single leg squat to see, it's like, all right, well, let's really see if those glutes are working, right? Let's give you the advanced version. Um, and if they still do really well, awesome, man. You've got a blank slate client that you can just write hard workouts for, right? But for the most part, Based on everything we just said, now I've got very different, look at these example exercises, right? A client whose feet turn out, we do a balance exercise. A client whose knees cave in, we do a side to side walking exercise to strengthen the glutes. Uh, a client who has an excessive forward lean, I do some core stabilization exercises. A client who low back, low back arches, I do some glute strengthening exercises. A client whose arms fall forward, I do some rowing exercises, right? So we got all kinds of different exercises that we are going to prioritize depending on what our client's posture is. And that is something we'll get more into, uh, you know, like I said, next module when we're looking at kinesiology, but this is something everyone in here should always be considering. So we look at our client's posture, we look at their cardio, and we do use those things to determine what type of stress. If your client struggles on the cardio, give them a foundation program. If your client's a cardio master, Give them an advanced, you know, high intensity interval program. If your client has knees caving in, strengthen the uh, medial glute. If your client has uh, excessive forward lean, well, strengthen the glute again, <laughs> uh, but also strengthen the low back like crazy. Um, so uh, before developing any exercise program, we definitely want to understand all of the components uh, of what's like all the pieces that are uh, around in their body and know which assessments and what exercises are important. Um, always, always, always start by gathering your subjective information, which is that PARQ and your general medical history questionnaire. Um, then gather your objective information like physiologic assessments, such as heart rate and blood pressure, body composition assessments like body weight, body fat percentage, body mass index, um, and uh, lean body mass. Uh, objective information, uh, you know, which we're going to see here, uh, posture, you know, do your uh, overhead squat, do your single leg squat, uh, do your pushing assessment, do your pulling assessment. Um, uh, yeah, oh, these are all the same subjective, yeah, subjective, Park U general medical, we already did all that. Uh, cardio endurance, right, the one mile walk run test. Um, so have your client run a mile as fast as they can test their time. Or maybe you do the three-minute step test, or maybe you do the Rockport walk test. All of them are good. Uh, muscular strength assessments, like the push-up test, the sit-up test, or the long jump test. Those are really fun because you're just testing uh, your muscular strength or your muscular power. Um, and then we can do Davies tests, right? Looking at specific, or I'm sorry, Sharks test, if we're looking at like specific athletic goals, how fast they can have lower body agility, or how fast they can have upper body agility. Well, that was one super disorganized like summary slide. That was that was a mess. Uh, <laughs> and that's it today, guys. Any questions? Dalen, Kenny, Andres, Cody, Charlie, how you guys feeling? I'm good, bro. Kind of good. Kind of fun, right? Or at least <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna get to do this stuff. Uh, we're gonna we're honestly probably a, a really good chunk of when we get back to like real Sochi a lot of our time will probably be spent on assessments because <laughs> um, they're such a big, big, big part of our, our like, you know, role. Um, it's going to be a lot. I think what we're going to spend most of our time playing catch up on is like doing fitness assessments and writing programs based on those fitness assessments, just like over and over and over and over and over again. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, if you guys don't get any, got any questions today, I can let you out of here and I will see all of you all tomorrow. Nope, that's not true. I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs> see you Monday, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> see you guys.